Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for, for joining this, this session about uh, repairing and preparing for the next generation. So um, in this session, we have two uh, very interesting panelists who will be sharing um, their thoughts on this uh, notion of the green recovery, which we've seen expressed in a lot of places around the world. So my name is Sarah Marif. Um, as you can see, I'm uh, head of environment and climate change unit at the International Energy Agency, and I'm really excited to sort of to hear what this conversation will be. Um, so today we're going to have uh, John Lofhead, who's the chair of the Mission Innovation Steering Committee, um, and we also have Thomas Astaba, who's a senior cities advisor at Climate KIC. Um, both people who've been uh, working on issues related to um, technology, climate, and innovation at different levels and different scales. Um, so very interesting to have perspectives from these different scales uh, with mission innovation being, uh, you know, sort of a leading international uh, multilateral push. Um, and um, with, uh, with work at the city's level. Um, so very interesting to think about green recovery and what that means for different levels and different people. So what I propose is I'll offer um, uh, John and then Thomas, the opportunity to sort of start out with a few opening remarks each for a few minutes, sort of share your, your general views on the, on the topic, and then we can proceed with, with uh, more of a discussion. So, um, John, I'd give the floor to you first. Thank you very much, Sarah, and good afternoon, everyone. So, as Sarah said, I'm the chair of the Mission Innovation Steering Committee. And for those who may not be familiar, Mission Innovation was an initiative that was launched at the Paris Climate Conference in 2015, in which 20 countries pledged to double their public sector investments in clean energy R&D within five years. So that's about now. Um, so far, the work of Mission Innovation has consisted of bringing together and helping coordinate different national efforts on clean energy R&D. And just a few weeks ago, uh, we had the annual ministerial meeting of the now 25 members of this initiative. And at that point, they unanimously agreed that they would renew Mission Innovation for a further mandate of between five and 10 years, but that they agreed with the proposals that we put forward that we would shift from an emphasis on how much money was being spent to a series of efforts to achieve specific outcomes in particular areas. And these are going to be a light range of new missions with specific outcome targets, which will be focused for delivery uh, initially uh, over five years. So why is clean energy important to the green recovery? Well, as you all probably know, energy systems underpin every element of modern society. The societies we have are built upon the availability of energy. And in those countries that are still in the phase of development where that's not the case, we can see uh, how that influences their infrastructure. We've also got a massive international effort to reduce our overall greenhouse gas emissions. And the energy system is a major contributor to that, along, of course, with industry, with transport and other areas. And in order to bring about the dramatic reductions that are being sought by increasing countries, then you can see that changing the energy systems we have, which are the product of several decades of investment and development, is going to be a, a massive task. Now, during the ministerial, several of the ministers from the countries pointed out that this was the time to redouble efforts because of the significance of energy systems, both from environmental terms, but also from the sheer economic investment that was needed in order to uh, make the changes that we want. But alongside that, if we're going to make these dramatic changes, the technologies that we have at the moment simply are not sufficient uh, to give us the consequences that we want. And that's why initiatives like Mission Innovation play a potentially a major role in the green recovery, because it is through these that the different nations that are active in this area can leverage their respective efforts off each other. And by adopting the common targets that will be the next, uh, the characteristic of the next phase of mission innovation, then that will hopefully help to focus the efforts a little bit more and help all of those individual country efforts to be better aligned towards a single goal. So 
really what we have there is a framework that will be contributory to the green recovery. It will mean that the efforts in innovation will be directed towards the benefits of a green recovery. And hopefully, by bringing together these international efforts, it will speed the rate at which we can go forward. I'll stop there, Sarah. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, John. That's, uh, that's very, very interesting. Um, I'm not sure if Thomas can hear me, but um, I will just let him know that um, I'd like to open the, the floor to Thomas now uh, to go ahead and make some remarks. Thank you, Sarah. And apologies if there was a little delay there. Um, for some reason, I'm not hearing Sarah, but I'm hearing John, and hopefully everyone else can hear me just fine. So um, I just wanted to take a few uh, moments to share some observations um, around the work that, that we're doing um, to help cities uh, develop transformational strategies and, as it aligns to the green recovery work. And, and just very briefly, so Climate Kick's working with 15 cities across Europe to develop um, strategies and use a, an innovation process to pursue 2030 climate neutrality uh, as a goal and to work in a very aggressive um, program of work that cuts across mm -hmm. citizen engagement, policy innovation, so uh, social innovation as well as business model and capital finance innovations as well simultaneously. and. Um, uh, despite all of the um, challenges that we're facing under the current moment, the, the idea of a, of a one-time investment in economic recovery and, and aid presents a really interesting opportunity uh, to help cities in that regard. And I think there are four points I want to highlight. One is, as those packages are put together, understanding what agency cities need to take on in terms of their role in shaping and making markets for the level of activity that's necessary for transformation. Many cities lack either the authority or the capacity and capability to do that. And so part of the investment needs to recognize that and potentially provide for that. I think the second is to make sure that this is really grounded in a clear understanding of the opportunity. Um, Recovery programs traditionally look at shovel-ready projects and understand the job creation and follow-on investment potential. But in something as, as quite unprecedented as this, I think we need to do uh, another layer of rigor, um, et cetera, so that we're able to um, so that we're able to really understand the potential and understand which sectors we should be prioritizing for these investments so that we're not um, we're not locking in future carbon emissions as a result of the short, the desire to make short-term investments. And I think that's well understood. Two more quick things. One is um, there's also work to be done with cities on understanding their role in shaping the deployment models for from which this aid can flow and this, these economic investments flow. And there are a couple of reasons why these deployment models matter. One is, um, there are specific objectives that can vary by community in terms of goals for inclusion, uh, accessibility to the jobs, as well as the workforce development needs that the population may have so that they're able uh, to join in. Um, and then the second is so that they're building in accountability in the execution. Too often when we're trying to move very fast with economic relief programs, uh, we don't take enough time to design that into the deployment model, and we end up six months, 12 months later wondering, did that money really get invested in the best way possible? So just another thought. And then the last thing, this is a one-time unprecedented public investment, um, which is going to have potentially transformational impact. The likelihood of that being 100% sure it will be transformation is if we understand how these investments can help cities and other jurisdictions de-risk the follow-on private investment that needs to come after this. Um, you know, in any city that's seeking decarbonization and, and climate resilience, they need to invest billions of euros. And that's more than they're going to get through any one package. And so we need to set the stage for that to happen. Um, I think I'll pause there and I'll have a few more comments as, as we go through. So look forward to the session. 
great. Thank you very much for that, uh, Thomas. Um, I think that's that's a really interesting perspective. Um, I think, John, if, if I may, I mean, um, if I can pick up something you said um, on directing the benefits of innovation towards green recovery. Um, and I'd be interested in hearing um, thoughts on how that happens uh, or what are ideas for, for tools that can happen. Um, uh, so perhaps on your side, it's from a, from a multilateral perspective um, or it's from a national perspective, perhaps um, given your, your previous roles as well within the UK government. And also from the city's perspective, I think Thomas, it's, it's, a, it's a really interesting um, perspective because a lot of the measures that people have flagged as being important for recovery, I know just from the perspective of the recovery plan that the IEA developed in June, looking at energy, um, a lot of those things are things that will be in urban environments where you will have different levels of government that are responsible for implementing those, whether it's on transport, uh, whether it's on buildings um, and all kinds of investments. Um, and also from that perspective, um, and, I'm, and I, when I use the word innovation, I'd use it broadly, perhaps um, either for technology innovation, as well as sort of business innovation, innovations and in practices and deployment, the kind of things, Thomas, I think um, that you've, you've sort of highlighted that are, that are key. Um, so just some views on really directing those types of things towards green recovery and views on that. Um, perhaps we can start uh, with John. Okay, thank you, Sarah. So I think that's a really pertinent question. And um, in terms of uh, the way that Commission Innovation is approaching it, um, and I'll pick up cities because I wanted to make, just make a quick comment on something that Thomas said. Um, we're working with the Global Covenant of Mayors uh, and we're working in that uh, to get them to help us define some of the outcomes that are actually needed and therefore the kind of innovation that is really required uh, so that people who have to deploy and implement on the ground have got better tools to do it with. Now, our researchers and innovators are, uh, without exception, excellent people, but sometimes those who are involved in the process of innovation don't necessarily fully understand the, uh, the barriers and the needs that the deployers actually have. So we see co-designing the outcomes that we're seeking from our own programs as being key that the, those outcomes then are deployable by the, the people that need to do it. And, and the point that I wanted to bring up that's relevant to that from, from Thomas's introduction well, I think one of the other challenges some cities face is they are generally a very good platform through which innovations can be tested and new systems can be deployed. But because they're smaller units than nations, sometimes they don't always have the skilled resource in place to make all the right decisions. So I think making the availability of skilled resources is quite important. And we hope that by the link up through the global covenant, and the, the efforts of mission innovation. One of the things that we'll do is increase the network to make the experts more available when those cities wish to actually uh, deploy it. And going back to the fact that they're smaller, I think one of the challenges with any innovation, if you start to try to implement it at a national or international level, that becomes a massive task of organization. And one of the great advantages of cities and regions is sometimes they have greater flexibility and agility to trial some of these things in their own particular circumstances because all of these um, cities have different needs depending upon their locations, the nature of their population, the nature of their economic activity and therefore they give you a massive base of potential demonstration platforms that can be then be used to trial and test innovations because not all the innovations will prove quite fit for purpose on the first iteration. And so I think one of the, the things that we can do on this uh, to answer Sarah's original question is by linking up with those that have got the ability to trial faster, to trial at a smaller scale, but to do so in a real environment is hopefully going to be a multiplying factor towards the speed at which we can innovate if we can get the food feedback loop correct on that. 
Yeah, and if I can just uh, pick up and build upon John's comments, because I think I agree with I, I agree with everything he said, and I think one of the one of the things that we've identified mm -hmm. and are really focused on in our work with the cities um, in our program is the the need for having access to the kind of capability that is necessary for this to to work, and and it's a multi disciplinary capability. Uh, it's not simply access to finance professionals or, or what have you. So um, I may just use a specific example to try to, to get a little deeper into this. And, you know, in, in almost every context, people want to talk about building retrofits and building energy use because it's a criti cri critical component to any decarbonization pathway. Um, but it's also the case that for 30 years, our ability to, to drive improvements in building energy performance has failed to live up to expectations. And I think there are a few reasons why. And, and it's really compelling in a, in, a, in a moment in time like this because normal rules don't necessarily apply. And, and by that, I mean, we have an opportunity to help cities go to building owners in their jurisdictions, it could be a region or, or even at a, member, at a national government level, and say, basically, our economic future depends on these resources moving through the economy, creating jobs and stimulating economic activity again. We're doing this in a way that is contributing directly to our climate imperative and emergency. Um, and in, in order to do that in the best possible way, we have to ask you to accept things that you wouldn't otherwise be willing to accept. And let me unpack that. So. My assertion is that for 30 years, we've treated the building owner as the quintessential key actor in building energy performance, despite the fact that building energy performance is one component of an energy system. And I think it's time for us to intervene with building owners as if they are just one part of the system rather than the decision maker about what happens. And uh, that, and by the way, that happens with water systems, with the mobility system around buildings, the city arranges for the investments to be made in the system. The investments are made and the building owner participates in whatever mechanisms are appropriate. Um, and I think we need to do that in building energy performance and basically say, we're going to do this, you're going to participate, and this is how it will work. And it can happen in a very simple, structured way that can also move much faster than individual buildings trying to organize it themselves. In my view, that's the only way you get to a credible scale of activity to create meaningful job creation in the short term and also change the story in terms of how we have not been succeeding in our decarbonization efforts. Um, and I'll just pause by saying this conversation happened uh, 11 years ago in the United States when after the financial crisis, the federal government decided to invest three billion in energy efficiency, building energy efficiency. And they directed about 500 million of that to, to cities. And there was an active conversation around, do not just give this money to the cities, hoping that they put it to use as quickly as possible, because it will not get the desired effect. And in fact, that's what they did. There was a real effort to say, take a little bit of time, go just a little bit slower, and figure out what lever you create for the city so that it has its own life after this initial cash is, is flowing. And, and unfortunately, the decision was made, we just need to move quickly. And sometimes moving quickly when you can just take a little bit more time to really design the approach ends up leaving you with results that you're not happy with. Thanks. Thanks for that, that insight um, and for sharing um, those, both those responses, very interesting. I think this idea of having to um, disperse funds quickly, but to get to get the kind of maximizing the kind of benefits that you want to get out of a green recovery. So whether it's, you know, maximizing sort of the benefits of innovation, um, taking the time to get better systems and ways of deploying, so it's more impactful, as you were mentioning, Thomas. Um, I think that's that's probably a big a big challenge. Um, just a, a bit of a sort of higher level question I had, given both of your perspectives, um, is sort of in the context, in the current context um, of the green recovery and innovation. I was wondering if you have heard a different kind of conversation about innovation. Are people 
talking about innovation differently in the context of the green recovery? Um, are things being put on the table that weren't put on the table before? So, so the example Thomas just gave, perhaps that's something new. Um, and so I'm just wondering if there is something about this moment um, and green recovery and the kind of things that are possible within it that you that stand out to you as being as being different, as being particular, um, or as being particularly interesting. Mm. Uh, shall I have a first go um, uh, on that? Please. So I I think um, there's probably not a different attitude towards innovation so much. But what I, I believe that I've detected is, first of all, a great faith in innovation. Uh, certainly in the political arena, innovation tends to be regarded as, as, as some kind of magic investment you make and everything comes good. Now, of course, I, I believe in investment in innovation, so I don't, uh, I don't take that away. Uh, but I think in terms of doing the innovation differently, not really, uh, if I'm uh, brutally honest. But, but I think what I mentioned earlier about uh, mission innovation moving towards a set of outcome-focused targets, I would say that there is a mood of directing innovation, of trying to clarify what it is that we need. That, of course, is only half the task because part of innovation is about finding answers you didn't know existed. So you've got to allow the freedom for that as well. Uh, but I, but I, think, I think what it, uh, what it does do is the natural anxiety to bring about an economic recovery means that uh, there is a search for those areas where we can not only generate activity and sustainable activity, as Thomas very rightly pointed out, uh, but but also we can use that as a lever to bring about some of the, the green changes as well. And, and I think that is probably the novel aspect of it, that the correlation of those two things is now being openly talked about in policy circles in a way that it probably wasn't done before. And if, if I can just pick one example, which is going to sound like boasting from my country, but it's not meant to be. If you look at the economic and the emissions performance of the UK since 1990, its GDP has increased at broadly the same rate as the uh, of the rest of the G7 countries. So it's gone up about 75% in, in that period. And during that time, its emissions uh, performance has been a reduction of 47% uh, in its emissions. So GDP up 75%, emissions down 47%. So first of all, it shows that you can do these things if you turn your mind to it. But secondly, if you look at the breakdown of, of employment, uh, that has created a set of new jobs and new economic activity, which encompasses in the UK around 500,000 people in jobs that didn't exist in 1990 at all. And, and that those are generating some of the newer technologies, newer products, newer infrastructures that we need to meet these broader aims. And um, I'll just finish with one final thing to pick up Thomas's point again. He talks about improving the energy performance of buildings. And, and I couldn't agree more with him than that. You must say something, Thomas, I disagree with so we can have an argument. But uh, <laughs> uh, the need to, to do that is immense when you look at the overall energy system and emissions performance. Yeah. And it has been very challenging. And one of the things I would add to your comments about the need for a bigger element on that, Thomas, is there's also the fact that in uh, an environment like my own country, you've got to persuade the people who live in the buildings that they want to do something about it. Now, sometimes they're owners. But if you look at uh, the studies that in the previous life I was involved with, there is actually a resistance to change. And I think there's an issue that comes into here, which is not just about the top down expenditure of money investment in things, but it's finding a way of doing it that delivers incentives and benefits to the individuals so that they feel that there is something in it for them to uh, to actually go along with this. Yeah, you know, just to just to add a, a couple of brief comments, I think one is 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 building on the, the question of innovation in this context. And I think there are two things that are worth noting. One is, um, unlike previous green recovery or economic recovery periods, particularly a decade ago, 
there is a much deeper appreciation of how, um, I guess, the innovation community, if you would term it as such, and cities as an institution, at least from my perspective, actually can connect together. Uh, I would say a decade ago, it was really, innovation was really seen as something that would touch two things. One, technology or point solution innovation combined with finance innovation. And now the conversation is one that's much more integrated around innovation and in support of systemic change. And so that's a big difference in where we were before. The challenge in a green recovery situation is people are trying to move quickly to restart economic activity and job creation. And innovation at a systemic level requires a little bit of a different approach because you actually have to learn what you don't know how to do before you do things. So go slow before you go fast. And, and that presents a bit of a challenge from an economic recovery perspective because people want to go fast. So there's tricky components there. What I would say, though, is things that can move very quickly that represent innovation tied to things like citizen engagement innovation, governance innovation, can put a lot of people back to work, can create a lot of economic activity before you get to bricks and mortar decisions that then are going to leverage much larger amounts of capital investment. And, and those things are actually critical to getting to the kinds of interventions John is referencing or I was speaking about before. You're not going to get building owners to embrace a new way of doing things without extensive engagement and without changing how governance works within that context. So those things kind of fit together. And, and, and I would say that that is a maturation of the innovation community with respect to the climate solutions in, in general. Great, thanks. I, I find both those um, views reassuring or, and positive. Um, I think it's, it's nice to see that we are seeing linkages between things, um, a broader perspective on how to link innovation with, with, with outcomes, how to make change, linking it to systemic change, and perhaps this maturation that's happened over time um, I mean, it's good that it's happened at this juncture when, when we do need to have this green recovery context. Um, perhaps one um, last question from me um, is the way the session was framed originally made reference to um, the Green Deal, the EU Green Deal, these sort of very high level ambitious uh, climate policy, um, you know, sort of things. Um, and my question is, I think sometimes people find it difficult to understand what those mean uh, in practice or concretely when we're thinking about actual policies and actual actions to make green recovery happen. So I was wondering if you would share a little bit what your views are in terms of a higher level political objective in the context of a green deal, whether it's a very ambitious climate goal um, or other ambitious innovation goals, and how you see that linked with your areas of practice um, and the kind of policies that are happening in your areas more concretely when it comes to, um, to recovery. Mm. Do you want me to go first again, Sarah? Um, I, I would, thank you. I, th I think um, any policy at the government level is rarely based upon one single concept. It takes into account all kinds of aspects. It has to take into account the impact on the public, the impact on you know national security, the the impact on uh, current processes and, and whatever. So I think that the uh, the the direct association of, of a green recovery and innovation is is a natural set of priorities that comes out of that total spectrum of things that have to be done in in any policy, and I think that. Um, the, uh, the the policies really on on a green recovery are going to come down on this selection of priorities of actions that will be needed. Um, so if if we look uh, and if we draw a lesson from history, go back to the the post Wall Street crash era in the United States, then the the New Deal that Roosevelt introduced focused down on saying we must generate economic activity, we must put people back to work 
we know that we're short of infrastructure. We need highways and we need um, uh, irrigation schemes, which, which uh, cause the construction of big dams and the rest of things. And so it was something that could be done at national level, and it was it was a decision that linked up a national need with with a need for an economic uh, recovery, a, a, a national functional need. So I think uh, when we look now at policies that may come about in the current situation, I think the, the the challenge in terms of getting engagement with those policies is going to be to tie them to needs that individuals will see and employment is one need but then also uh, being able to relate them very explicitly to to a bigger national need and that could be uh, the replacement of infrastructure uh, that is perceived to be aging it could be to meet uh, climate objectives which which is a world necessity it could be not simply employment but to say this is going to take us into those new industries that will have an international outreach as we go forward because we tend to think of these things very much in national scales, but there are many developing countries around the world that are either in, in, uh, putting in place some of these things for the first time or um, rolling out at a greater scale, deploying at a greater scale what they're doing. So I think framing that argument would be really valuable for the policies because otherwise they risk being just another random government decision to invest in something that means nothing to individuals. So um, I think to summarize that, I think um, picking up Thomas's point about um, test slowly and don't, you know, don't rush into acting, I think that could be applied also not to slowing down the policies, but thinking very carefully about how will these policies appeal relevant to the bulk of the population in those countries so that they're seen to be both responding to the need and also delivering greater goods. All right, uh, just a, a couple of thoughts maybe to build on um, the, the area of practice and work that we're doing with cities um, ties to higher level policy approaches in the in, in the Green Deal specifically. And I, I think as many here know, there's, there's a specific component in the Green Deal for cities um, to work towards carbon neutrality by 2030 um, and to be socially innovative um, as, as outlined in the, in the heading for that. I think I might speak to a few points in particular. One is um, in working with cities, helping them understand how they can communicate up to senior government, what it is that they need specifically to be able to take the actions that many want them to be able to take. And so I, I think I spoke earlier about giving cities agency. I think cities also need to work proactively to express, here's what we can do, here's what we'd like to do, but, here, but can't do currently, here's how you can help us do that. And the resources won, but in many time, many cases, these higher level policies are about giving agency and creating positive accountability for cities to be able to follow through with action. And when you're when you're doing something like that, which can be in normal circumstances politically difficult, it's a lot easier when it's a quid pro quo. So we're going to give you a whole bunch of money as part of this economic aid package. As part of that, we're requiring you to do two things that are going to change how markets work and how these systems work within your jurisdiction. And the local elected officials will be very grateful for that because it takes the political responsibility off of them to do all of the work around those very challenging policy innovations. So that's one thing. I think the other is there's always a risk uh, at a senior government level, uh, particularly when the numbers around uh, financial support get very large of over specifying what it is you want the cities in this case to do and so you end up tying their hands to innovate because you're worried about failure at the senior level the last thing you want right is for the headline to be city x spent you know 500 million on a on a complete white elephant project that was a complete disaster so they write rules and restrictions that preclude 
the worst case from happening, but that also tends to tie the hands locally. And so thinking quite carefully at a higher level of government, how to create positive accountability, hold open space for the kinds of innovation that you want, and then give the flexibility and agency to the local jurisdictions to do things within their own sphere of influence. So th those would be some thoughts. And, and could I just quickly add to that as well, Thomas? I, I agree with that. And I think there's also the question about very often local governments and cities are best placed to devise the solutions that meet their local needs because they've got an insight and an understanding of, of those needs and their local conditions that is really important. Indeed. Indeed. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, um, I might just I might just add a specific example. We're talking with Madrid, and I'm sorry if I'm speaking over Sarah because I cannot hear her. But um, in uh, in Madrid's case, we've helped them put together their um, proposal to the Spanish government for part of their work in the economic recovery, and they've been interacting very directly with uh, both the regional and national government on a specific set of actions that advance both direct economic uh, relief and and stimulus, but also contribute significantly to the city's efforts to advance climate action. And you know that convert that's a conversation. It's not a one way street. It's not even a two way street. It's a back and forth conversation, and ultimately a, a an advanced type of negotiation. And I think it's important that we just recognize that. Yeah. Thanks. That's that's a really great example. Um, and I, I really enjoyed hearing from this conversation the notion of linking things through chains and not, not only just different levels and how do we get higher levels of policymaking to be relevant um, and also very concrete ways in which that can happen, um, which I've really enjoyed hearing about in terms of what are the things citizens will see, how, does, how can we intersect broader, all kinds of societal needs with the green recovery need, with the economic recovery need? What are those other societal needs that fit into that? Um, and how cities in particular are such a key environment for uh, enabling those kinds of links to happen. Um, since we're almost out of time, I will um, maybe just allow you both to make some closing remarks uh, for a couple of minutes. The, again, the heading of the session, um, interestingly, was to prepare and prepare for the next generation. I think the idea being that what we're going through, um, I mean, we all experience this, this crisis and economic impact, of course, but sort of the next generation are really going to um, be probably very strongly affected by this, not just the economic aspect, but also the, the climate commitments, our ability to meet all kinds of sustainability goals. Um, and so it's interesting to think about it in that sense of what do we what do we need to do and how do we need to think about that generation as well, which is a, a long running theme in the, in the sustainability debate. But uh, yeah. so I would just open the floor for for your closing thoughts. So um, John, perhaps you could go first. Okay, thank you. Well, clearly, a, a green recovery is something that's very much aimed at preparing for the future. Um, but we must remember, I think, in this conversation, that while that notion is accepted within Europe and in a number of countries around the world, it's not universally accepted. Um, there are some places where it's not a wise thing to talk about the green recovery, but to talk about an economic recovery instead. Um, but I think that what it does do is it offers uh, an opportunity for three things, in, in my view. And I'm, I'm going to take this from a mission innovation perspective, uh, because that, that's the one that I see most clearly. I, I think the first thing is that it gives much more space for innovation, but innovation with an agreed purpose uh, than we typically have seen before. And so we're almost certainly going to see uh, further increases in the public sector commitment to financing and resourcing that information. And, and the price or the, the, the quid pro quo for that is that we're clear what it is that we're trying to achieve. We're not just doing it for our own sake. Um, that in itself will generate a, a greater awareness for the future of the value of innovation itself in, in generating future economic recovery. I think the second thing that we've got 
is uh, what I would like to pick up on your line, which is linkages, Sarah. Uh, because as part of what we've been doing, we've been putting a lot of effort into saying it's great for national governments to come together with some kind of an agreement and form a club and have officials flying around the world under normal circumstances for various meetings to, to talk about it. We want to make this initiative accessible to and engaged with the key players, and, and that is uh, local governments, and it's also industry, and it is young people. So as part of that, in each of our major events, we bring along young innovators uh, that are exemplars of the kind of activity that we're looking for and explain the role that they can play in helping this. But we're also opening up to the cities as well through the links I've described. And we're also working with a number of the international business organizations to say, we need your help in making what we're doing accessible to business because they have also got to be involved in this. It doesn't mean they've got to finance it, but they need to help us set the outcomes and the targets, and they need to be engaged in some of the big missions that we'll be launching in a few months' time that will be the manifestation of that. So I think engagement is uh, the second uh, thing that I'd say. And the final point that uh, I would make is that I think that we can actually make this an exciting public project in a way that we've failed to do in other areas. But we've, over the last 15 years, we've seen the impact of the global financial crisis that caused a dramatic drop in world GDP. And although the rate of GDP increases uh, had more or less recovered, it's not regained where we expect it to be. And the impact now of the pandemic has been to depress that lower base even further. And so the recovery of how do we survive the circumstances that we're in, well, here's one big chunk. We're going to make our efforts on emissions reduction and environmental protection the vehicle through which we can stimulate a more rapid economic recovery as we come out of this. And I think that that is something that will both um, increase the confidence of those who set policies that they're going in the right direction, but more importantly, it will engage the broader community so that this doesn't just become a discussion between national policymakers. Yeah, I think that's I think that's great. And maybe for for just some um, comments from me to build on on this and thinking about the next generation. You know, one of the one of the ways I would think about this, and this ties very directly to the concept of mission innovation, which is um, is to recognize that we're holding on to two realities at the moment. One is the current reality that that is being forced to change in response to COVID and the and the the ways in which we work and live and move about. It's forcing a change. We can look at that from where we are now and see some things. What we can't do from that position is understand where do we actually want our communities to be in 10 years? And we have to have both of those conversations simultaneously and those conversations have to interact with each other. Um, because that's how we can open up this space where people are willing to embrace programs, investments, policies, et cetera, that they wouldn't otherwise. If you're just sitting in this other chair, here's where I am now. I know things are changing, but I don't have a full picture of what's gonna happen in 10 years. But if we know in 10 years, mobility is going to have to be dramatically different, not just because of COVID, but because of decarbonization imperatives and the fact that we cannot have single use vehicles dominating our, our city landscape. Uh, and infrastructure. And those vehicles that we do have are going to have to be zero emission vehicles. That's a very different place to start from than here. And we have to have both of those conversations together and our engagement around what a green recovery looks like has to pull those two conversations into one conversation and have people sit with the reality that you're going to have a different car if you have one at all. Your house is going to be different. Your workplace is going to be different. There are ways in which those investments could be made on your behalf, allowing you to access technology that you wouldn't choose or could afford on your own. But you have to agree towards supporting the kind of collective action necessary for that to work. Individuals making behavior change does not lead to systems change. 
It helps to support it, but it doesn't lead to it. So we need to connect those conversations into a single one. So thanks very much. Thanks for that, Thomas. That's, uh, that's really great, I think. Thank you both for those, those remarks. And I think this, this idea we're hearing about um, those two realities, and I think in the way it's sort of the sort of short term and long term is how we think about it sometimes when we look at changes in energy and what we need. And I think that's really key. And I think, uh, you know, and I'm glad that people are thinking about this and that the IA is in good company and, and also having really tried to bring this perspective to the way we've talked about green recoveries and how sustainable energy needs to be part of that and a key part of that. And what do we, what do we need to do in the next three years um, to make sure that what happens is consistent with where we want to be um, in not just 10 years, but, but beyond uh, in a lot of ways. And your point on behavior change is also very interesting. It's a complicated field that we've looked at a little bit um, where when you look at very ambitious goals globally, net zero emissions, et cetera, we see that we do need the kinds of shifts that aren't just gonna be individual changes, but we will need systems to change to enable behavior to change. So I think those are, those are all really interesting points. And, and I think this talking about an exciting public project is, is really key. So um, thank you both. I've, I've really learned a lot and uh, I've gotten a lot of it out of this conversation. I hope, I hope those listening did as well. Um, really, really excellent. And uh, we did go over time a little bit. So apologies for that, um, but uh, thank you very much. So um, I'll say goodbye from me. Thank you very much, Sarah. Goodbye. <laughs>